So thank you for joining us this evening for Neanderthal Minds in light of recent discoveries with Dr. Thomas Wynn. I'm Megan Wilbar, Museum Coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library. This is the first program of 2021 in our monthly series presented by the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society. Dr. Wynn will be answering questions at the end, so please type your questions into the chat box. I'll now turn it over to Doug Baxter, President of the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society, for the proper introduction to tonight's program. Um, thank you both for being here this evening, and I'll turn it over to you now, Doug. Okay. Thank you, Megan. I appreciate it. And thanks to the Rawlings Library for co-sponsoring our speaker. Um, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to make a couple of announcements on behalf of the Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society, or PAWS, as we say it. For those who are tuning into tonight's program and are not members of PAWS, I would like to invite you to check out our website newsletter, our website and our newsletter on our website and our Facebook page. The Pueblo Archaeological and Historical Society has many interesting activities, speakers, and educational things to do. So if you're interested in archaeology or history or just being around fun, interesting people, uh, you might consider becoming a member of PAWS and enjoy activities that are fun, interesting, and educa educational and thought-provoking. One of the fun and engaging acti activities that we offer is a book discussion group. And not by coincidence, I'll hold up this book, our next book for book discussion is How to Think Like a Neanderthal, co-authored by tonight's speaker, Dr. Thomas Wynn. Uh, I'd like to invite you to a lively book discussion on how to think like a Neanderthal, tall, February 22nd at 6.30 uh, p.m. This will be a virtual discussion. And for more details, you can check out our PAUSE newsletter on our website or our Facebook page. Our next month's speaker will be Jim Campbell, who will be telling us about one of Pueblo's early pioneers most of us don't know about, Peter Dotson. This is a fascinating story you won't want to miss. The program will be, uh, again, co-sponsored by uh, Rawlings Library, March 4th, 7 p.m. Uh, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Thomas Wynn. Dr. Wynn earned his AB in Sociology and Anthropology at Occidental College and his MA and PhD in Anthropology at University of Illinois, Urbana. His training was in Archaeology of the Lower Paleolithic or Early Stone Age, and in the 1970s and 1980s, he participated in field projects in Europe and Africa. In 1976 and 1980, he directed the first systematic archaeological field work in uh, Mabaya, I, I knew I was going to butcher that, region in Tanzania. Uh, his doctoral research opened a previously unexplored direction in Paleolithic studies, the explicit use of psychological theory to interpret archaeological remains. It applied to, I'm going to butcher this word too, Piaget, help me, Dr. Wynn? Piaget. Piaget theory and concepts to document the evolution of hominin spatial cognition from the first stone tools to the appearance of modern hum humans. His 1979 article in the journal Man, titled The Intelligence of Later uh, Acheulean Hominids, continues to be cited 40 years after its appearance and is considered to be one of the found, uh, foundation documents of evolutionary cognitive archaeology. He has published extensively in Paleoethic Studies, 150 plus articles and book chapters, with particular emphasis on cognitive evolution. His books include The Evolution of Spatial Competence in 1989, the Rise of Homo Sapiens, The Evolution of Modern uh, Thinking uh, with Fred Coolidge, How to Think Like a Neanderthal, also with Fred Coolidge, and First Sculpture, Hand Axe to Figure Stone with artist Tony uh, Berlant. Please welcome Dr. Thomas Wynn. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and uh, thank you, Megan. And let me see if I can start sharing a screen. is testing my technical skills. <laughs> 
Good. Um, as uh, Doug mentioned a couple of minutes ago, my primary interest has been in cognitive archaeology. And about 10 years ago, Fred Coolidge and I founded the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Neanderthals were a, a subject I had, to be honest, uh, tried to avoid for most of my professional career. Uh, the reason is tied to uh, really the history of Neanderthal studies and the fact that pretty much everybody has an opinion about Neanderthals. So what I thought I would do tonight uh, is update a little bit on the material in the book. Um, there have been some developments in the last 10 years that are not in the, in the book itself. And so I'd like to update that a little bit and also repeat some of the arguments that are in the book that I think are important for understanding a little bit about Neanderthals. First of all, I, I should probably talk a little bit about um, how you pronounce it, since, um, since Megan asked me earlier. No matter how you spell it, it's pr pronounced Neanderthal. Uh, no TH sound in English. Uh, that's because in German, uh, it means the Neander Valley. And in the word for valley in German, or one of the words for valley is tall. Um, it's always pronounced with a solid T sound. The spelling of Neanderthal has changed. Uh, for much of the time, it was spelled with the TH, but German changed the way tall was spelled. And there's been a trend recently to spell Neanderthals the way Germans spend um, spell Neanderthals as well. Though I should say that now there tends to be a swing back towards maybe not spelling it the way it should be spelled. So however you spell it, and both ways are acceptable, it is pronounced Neanderthal. Neanderthals occupy a very interesting place in human evolutionary studies. They're probably the only fossil type that almost everybody has heard of. That is, if you would walk up to somebody on the street and ask them if they uh, are a Neanderthal or have heard of a Neanderthal, they probably know what you're talking about. And most of them would probably consider it to be an insult. Um, generally, if we call somebody a Neanderthal, uh, it's considered to be an insult. This is because a hundred years ago, when Neanderthals were first being fully described in Europe, the image that you see on the screen was the standard one presented. That is the brutish caveman. And over, over the course of um, the last century, our opinions about Neanderthals have swung back and forth, almost like a pendulum. So 100 years ago, they were considered to be brutes. When I was an undergraduate in the 1960s, the trend was to look at them as being indistinguishable from modern humans. And then later, when we learned more about Neanderthal brains and a little bit about uh, more about Neanderthal technology, they started to look a little bit more primitive again. And now we've uh, the current view of Neanderthals is that they're really much more like modern humans. And in fact, many of my colleagues argue that they are essentially indistinguishable from modern humans in all behavioral respects. And a little bit of this is uh, more taste than evidence. Um, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is that, although in many respects, Neanderthals and the modern humans living at the same time were very much alike, there were in fact some differences between them. One of the things that has happened in, in the last 10 years since we wrote the book is the understanding of the geographic distribution of Neanderthals has expanded. We now know that Neanderthals extended into Central Asia. If you look at the slide uh, up at the little purple blotch up on the to the right hand corner uh, is the Altai Mountains and there are Neanderthal sites in the Altai Mountains. There are also Neanderthals in Kazakhstan which you can see in the green. And there are quite a few Neanderthal remains from the Middle East, which you can see in orange. But most of what we know about Neanderthals comes from Europe and the, the blue 
countries on the map. Neanderthals really were a group of prehistoric humans who were adapted to northern latitudes, not tropical latitudes. Something else that's changed in the last 10 years, perhaps even more dramatically, is the chronology for Neanderthals. We now know that Neanderthals evolved in Europe from a local population of what we call Homo heidelbergensis. And that evolution probably occurred about half a million years ago. Based on genetic evidence, and I'll be talking a little bit more about genetics later, we can date the split between modern humans and Neanderthals back to before 500,000 years ago. Some are even arguing as early as 800,000 years ago now for the split between lineages. You may have all heard of a group called the Denisovans, which we know only from DNA. I'll talk a little bit about them in a minute. Um, based on the same argument using comparative DNA, Neanderthals split from the Denisovans more recently in the, in the past, only uh, perhaps 300,000 years ago. The most significant change in Neanderthal chronology, though, is at the other end. Neanderthals appear to have disappeared as a distinct population by 40,000 years ago. In the book, we use the date 30,000 years ago. What's happened is a change in radiocarbon dating and the way radiocarbon dating is done and the way samples are cleaned and how the process is done. And as a result of that, most of the dates that were older than 25,000 years have been pushed back even further. And now it looks as if Neanderthals were probably effectively extinct as a distinct population by about 40,000 years ago. So let's talk a little bit about Neanderthals anatomically. I've showed you two views here. On the left is a modern human skull. I chose a fairly robust male rather than a lightly built female. And on the right, we have a Neanderthal male. Several things I think should be pointed out. Um, the Neanderthal cranium is a little bit different. That is the brain case is a little bit different. It's actually much more, uh, much longer. And the point of maximum breadth is lower on the head than it is. It looks a little bit more like a football than a modern human skull does. Something you might also notice is the ridge of bone over the eyes. This is known as a supraorbital torus or brow ridge. Neanderthals had a very good set of brow ridges. This is related to the size of the face. Neanderthals had very large faces um, compared to modern humans. In addition to having brow ridges, the eye sockets themselves are larger. So there's some thinking that Neanderthal eyeballs may have been a little bit larger than those of modern humans. One of the things you would probably notice if you saw Neanderthal would be the large noses, the nasal cavity, Cavities are larger, and the external noses are almost certainly larger as well. Nothing that would look particularly, say, alien, but you would probably notice them as having large noses. They had larger teeth, the mandibles, the jaws were bigger, and they didn't have a protruding chin. This is because the tooth rows were longer. What's happened in modern humans is the teeth have gotten smaller and the tooth row has shrunk but it's left the chin behind. These are three reconstructions of Neanderthals that have been done recently. There's sort of a cottage industry out there for reconstructing Neanderthals. Um, you can, if you go online, you can find lots of different reconstructions. What's interesting about this one, or the, the ones up here are one, the Neanderthal girl on the lower right and the Neanderthal woman on the upper right. And this one, uh, uses red hair and blue eyes. And this is based on some genetic uh, evidence that was discovered about 10 years ago. We mentioned it in the book, but I'll have a bit more to say about it before. These reconstructions are based on casts of Neanderthal skulls, and they use the same tissue depths that we use for modern humans. So these are fairly accurate reconstructions 
other than the hair, which of course we don't know much about, except that there are some genes for red hair in some Neanderthal groups. There are also differences below the head with Neanderthals. And some of these are actually very interesting. And there's a long list of them on the left here. A couple that I would like to point out. If you look at the scapula, the shoulder blade, the evidence for muscle attachment for Neanderthals is much more pronounced. Neanderthals were much more muscular than we were. We can see that on almost all of the bones. The long bones have thicker cortical layers. And that is the bones themselves are thicker. And we sometimes use the term robusticity for this. So Neanderthal bones were more robust. The, body, the limb proportions were a little bit different. That's slightly shorter arms in relationship to their legs than modern humans and slightly shorter legs in relationship to the body height. This is a classic adaptation to the cold and we think it's related to cold adaptation. There haven't been a lot of recent discoveries about Neanderthals anatomically that are particularly surprising. Indeed, in the last 10 years, I think there's only been one relatively complete articulated Neanderthal found at a site in Spain, the name of which escapes me. So pretty much what we know about Neanderthal anatomy hasn't changed. There are a few things. One concerns the length of the thumb. There's been a fair amount of writing in the last five years about Neanderthal thumbs, uh, and they were a little bit longer, especially on the final digit, the very tip of the thumb is a little bit longer. And this has led to people arguing that Neanderthals may not have been adept at precision grips as modern humans, or they might have been better at power grips. A power grip is like you hold a hammer. I think the reasoning for the power grip is pretty good. I'm not so sure about the reasoning for them being not as adept in terms of precision grip. Another point that's become pretty clear in the last 10 or 15 years is that Neanderthals apparently habitually use their front teeth as a kind of third hand. If you look at the front incisors, they almost always have scratch marks from flint tools as if they were holding meat in their mouth and then cutting them off with a flint tool or holding other things in their mouth and then cutting them with a flint tool. There's also been an interesting argument made about the large eye sockets, suggesting that they result from lower light conditions in high latitudes. And as we'll see in a second, and there are also some changes in the occipital lobes that might be related to that as well. And finally, there's been a lot of work recently on developmental rates in Neanderthals, especially looking at enamel development of the teeth as a way to time individual developments. And it looks as if Neanderthals may have matured slightly faster than modern Homo sapiens. That is, they would have reached puberty a little bit more quickly than a modern human, reached adulthood a little bit more quickly. We're not talking years here, we're talking months on average, so it's not really a great deal. Now, my major interest, of course, is in Neanderthal cognition. So I'm more interested in brains than I actually am in, in bodies. And what we have here are two endocasts. And endocasts are made by basically pouring plaster inside a skull um, and looking at what comes. Actually, you pour rubber inside the skull and then you pull the rubber out and then you um, have an internal cast of the brain. As you can see, you don't get much detail from that, but you do get a little bit. And a couple of things that you can see from these are that the Neanderthal brain is a little lower top to bottom in relationship to its length than the modern human brain is. Now, brain size-wise, there's effectively no difference. Actually, the average size of Neanderthal brains is larger than the average size of a modern human brain. This is partially a sample error because there are two very large Neanderthal males from Amud and from Ferris Sea that are over 1,700 cubic centimeters. And this has skewed the sample uh, so much that the average is much higher. It's thought that really 
especially if you compare Neanderthals to the modern humans who are the, living at the same time, the brain sizes, overall brain sizes were about the same. One way to look at brains other than using endocasts is by using x-rays and putting together a sort of x-ray model of the brain. That's what's going on here. Fellow at um, University of Burgos, Emiliano Brunner does this a lot. And then he measures geometric positions on the brains, various arcs and various cords to try to determine what actually was different about the Neanderthal brain than the modern human brain. So I put this picture of a modern human brain so we can talk about some of these things. Probably the most significant difference was in the parietal lobes. We mentioned this in the book, but that continues to be true. These are in yellow in the photo. Uh, these are the parts of the brain that are up on the back on the sides. And that's where the most significant difference is. Modern humans have expanded parietal lobes compared to Neanderthals. The overall volume of the frontal lobes is not that much different. There's also a slight difference in the occipital lobes. Neanderthals have slightly larger occipital lobes than modern humans do. And some have argued this is again related to the light issue of low light levels and processing light. One sort of surprise is the cerebellum, this feature down at the bottom part of the brain, the sort of orange feature at the bottom. Uh, modern humans, this is associated with movement and balance primarily. And modern human brains have a larger cerebellum than the brains of Neanderthals. Another point is the temporal pole. Um, you can see that's purple here. It means the temporal lobes protrude a little further forward in modern humans. And then modern humans apparently have a slightly larger olfactory bulb, which is the part of the brain that processes smell. So what this tells us is that Neanderthal brains were in fact different from modern human brains. Using that to predict behavior turns out to be very difficult though. We can't come to any specific conclusions about behavioral difference just because we see differences in parietal lobes. We can make some suggestions, but it's really hard to reach anything conclusive. So now we come to DNA. Probably the most significant developments in Neanderthal studies that have occurred in the last 10 years are in the studies of archaic DNA. And as we mentioned in the book, it is possible to extract DNA from Neanderthal bones, and it's possible to reconstruct their genomes. Now, we can't reconstruct the entire, entire chromosomes, but we can reconstruct enough of the DNA that we can actually measure how similar the DNA is to modern humans. So we can do several things with this archaic DNA. First of all, I should say a little bit about this for those of you who don't have a background. Uh, human, both humans and Neanderthal genomes, that is our DNA, each have about 3 billion base pairs. Those are those little paired elements on the DNA that you can see on the right. Human and Neanderthal genomes are 99.7% the same. This is actually different from the textbook. In the textbook, I think we use 99.8. We now know more about it, and the similarity seems to be slightly less than it was thought 10 years ago. What this means is there are about 9 million base pair differences between Neanderthal genomes and modern human genomes. Sounds like a lot. But I want to emphasize that this doesn't mean there are 9 million gene differences. It only means there are 9 million base pair differences. Genes can be anywhere from a few hundred base pairs to thousands of base pairs. Now, I should, as a point of comparison, say that modern humans are all 99.9% .9 the same in terms of DNA. So this means that Neanderthals are about three times more different from us than any one of us is from any another one of us. So what can we do with that? Well, there are several things we can do. One of the most interesting things is to look at population history and genetic admixture. And this is by comparing the genomes of archaic hominins like Denisovans and Neanderthals to modern humans. Now, I should say a word about Denisovans at this point. 
They were discovered from the site of Denisova Cave in Siberia about 15 years ago. And they were so well preserved that they could recover DNA. But it turned out that they picked, they thought they were working with Neanderthals. And they picked a little pinky bone from one of the scattered bones and used it to reconstruct the DNA. And it turns out it had a completely different genome that is different from Neanderthal genome, different from modern human genome. And it was only known from a pinky bone. Now we have about nine bone fragments of Denisovans. So we have a fair look at the DNA and we know that it was different from Neanderthals. We know that it was different from modern humans. And by comparing them to one another, the first thing we can do is get a sequence of branching. So if you look on the slide, what you see is a kind of family tree that branches as it moves up from the bottom. And the first split in this group occurred, again, before 500,000 years ago. And this was between modern humans on the left and the Denisova Neanderthal group on the right. Then about 200,000 years later, the Denisovans split off from the Neanderthals. So just using DNA, we can come up with a sequence of evolutionary splitting events. Now you'll see some percentages on here with arrows. This is a little bit different. This is looking at how much admixture there is between the two populations. And admixture means how many Neanderthal genes ended up in modern human populations. <clears throat> Just a second. And 10 years ago when um, Svante Pabo first published his work, he was estimated between two and 4%. Now we've lowered the estimate to between one and 2%. That is modern humans living in Europe and Asia have one to 2% Neanderthal genes. Interestingly, people living in Oceania have higher percentage of Denisovan genes than they have of Neanderthal genes. Second thing we can do with DNA is try to reconstruct what is known as population structure based on the kinds of variability we see in DNA. And the estimates are now that the population size for Neanderthals based on genes was very low some estimate as low as 2,500 living at any given time. Now, other estimates are as high as 60,000. Why the difference? Well, this is sort of a difference between the geneticists and the archaeologists. The geneticists argue for very small populations. The archaeologists, based on number of sites, um, really suggest it looks like there were a lot more people on the landscape than just 3,000. Um, but getting geneticists to listen to archaeologists is sometimes kind of difficult. You don't have to quote me on that. The other thing we know about population structure is that Neanderthals often practiced extreme inbreeding. At Denisova Cave, for example, which also had Neanderthals, there's one group of individuals who were children of a half-sibling mating that is, their parents were half siblings. And this is actually apparently fairly typical with Neanderthal groups, is very close inbreeding um, with cousins, with aunts, with half siblings. And as you know about, if you know anything about population genetics, that has some real downsides to it. So, our, one of the reasons I emphasize this is it reinforces the picture of Neanderthal social behavior that we describe in the book. It looks as if Neanderthals lived in very small social groups and they practiced inbreeding. They didn't do much mating out. In the textbook, we speculate about mating out, but it doesn't look like it happened as often as we thought it did. And a final population piece, which doesn't come from the genes, but comes from skeletal material, is that it looks as if 80% of Neanderthals died before the age of 40. Finally, another thing we can do is try to figure out what those gene differences did. Now, interestingly, they didn't have to do anything and we could still use them to trace populations. 
But if we want to know how different they were behaviorally, it would be nice to know what the genes were doing. And the way we do that is kind of interesting. What we do is we identify modern people with the Neanderthal variant of a gene. And then we try to find as many examples as possible and see if we can pick up any statistical trends in those people. So the way we do this is really by studying modern people with Neanderthal genes. Well, one thing I should say right off the bat is very few of these Neanderthal genes actually code for a specific anatomical trait. Most of the genetic differences are in what we call regulatory genes. That is genes that control how traits develop, not whether, not the nature of the trait itself. So, and you've probably heard this, most of the genes, most commonly, the genes that we see from Neanderthals are genes regulating skin and hair. And there are genes for skin color, there are genes for hair color, and these are probably related to adaptations to reduced light levels, or at least that's the argument that's been made. That's why light skin exists is as an adaptation to reduce levels of UVB radiation. There are also genes regulating the immune system. And the most interesting bit of that now is that people with the Neanderthal variant have greater susceptibility to COVID-19. Finally, there are a number of genes that are related to mood differences. And some of these mood differences are related to things like depression and schizophrenia. Um, again, remember, these are genes that are regulating other genes. So I don't want you to think that Neanderthals had genes for schizophrenia. It's just that these were genes in parts of genomes that are in those particular mood systems. But of course, what I'm most interested in are genes related to neural development. And recently, a paper has come out in the journal BMC Genomics, um, which identified 212 differences in neural regulatory regions. That is 212 nucleotide differences between Neanderthal DNA and modern human DNA that fall in areas of the genome that controls neural development. And a substantial proportion of these appear to be related to the regulation of neural proliferation. And neural proliferation governs the growth in number of neurons. So there's some difference in the way neurons were growing. Now, the genes don't tell you what. And in one of the more sort of macabre science fiction experiments in the literature, it's an experiment with organoids. And in organoids, what they do is take neural stem cells and then they splice in the Neanderthal gene variant and then they grow it in a Petri dish or in a test tube and see whether the growth pattern resembles the growth pattern of human neural cells. And it turns out that there's a difference. That is, these genes actually are controlling a different growth pattern in Neanderthal neural cells. Now, that doesn't tell us what that means from a behavioral point of view, but it does tell us that the brains were different. Now, I'm gonna review quickly some of the things about technology in the book. I could talk for the next hour about Neanderthal technology. Um, we know a great deal about Neanderthal technical abilities because we have lots of stone tools. And Neanderthals were very good at a technique of stone napping called Lavalois technique which is one of the most sophisticated techniques for napping stone. And this gives you the basic steps in Lavalois. I won't run through them because it takes a while, but basically you prepare a core in order to remove one very large flake. And that's the Lavalois technique. And then they'd modify the flake into a knife or a projectile point. But it turns out that it was even more sophisticated than that the Neanderthals to do Lavalwa had to control the volume of the core very carefully. So there were two asymmetric volumes, the top of the core and the bottom of the core, and they couldn't be the same. They had to be different. And they would often re-prepare the core. So it's a very complicated system and it requires a good deal of, of planning your steps so that you don't mess up what's happening in the future. We talk about that a lot in the textbook, but I wanted to talk a little bit about something else, which has become 
kind of a hot topic in the last 10 years. And this is the evidence for adhesives. And we now know that Neanderthals attached their projectile points to the spears using glue. And they did it in several different ways. The one we know the most about is using a glue made out of birch bark. And uh, Rebecca Rag Sykes, who by the way has just published a book on Neanderthals, um, wrote her dissertation on this and she developed techniques for producing the uh, adhesive using birch bark. And she described all of the steps and it turned out to be very complex. You had to raise the heat to a certain temperature, then, then bury it, then uncover it. And it all sounded very complicated. And so she made a, an argument that the technical complexity of the, the adhesive was so high that these, that it was just as complex as anything modern humans do, which is a really kind of a provocative argument. But then two years ago, some Germans decided that that sounded a little bit fishy and they tried to do it a little bit more simpler. And what they did is they took the birch bark, you can see up in the upper left, a roll of birch bark, and they put it underneath a rock and they just set it on fire. And they let it burn there for several hours. And they did that several times in a row. And it turns out that the smoke and the, the sort of the chemicals that come off of the fire were deposited on the rock. They could scrape it off of the rock and come up with the same adhesive that Rebecca Rag Sykes took hours making in a more complicated system. So it turns out that producing the birch tar wasn't as complex as people had originally thought, that there are simpler ways of doing it. This doesn't mean that Neanderthals didn't do the more complex way, but one of the things we have to do uh, when we talk about the past is uh, really use Occam's razor and argue that the, the simplest procedure that can explain the evidence is likely to have been the one people were using. Now, this is a slide I, I used several years ago at, at a talk I gave in, in Japan on expert cognition. Um, this is one of the arguments that Fred Coolidge and I have been working on for almost 20 years now. It turns out that modern humans and Neanderthals use the same kind of thinking when they're thinking technologically. We know this from reconstructing Neanderthal stone tool manufacture. We know this from the way modern humans do things. This is kind of an elaborate chart of what goes on um, based on what are called retrieval structures, uh, which are large bodies of information that are held in long-term memory and activated in working memory. Um, we could spend the next 30 minutes going over this chart, but, but the point here is that as far as we can tell, when making and using tools, Neanderthals and modern humans did, this, did it the same way. So any differences in cognition were not involved in technology. One of the more interesting things about Neanderthals, of course, is their hunting. And we know a lot about their hunting practices because hunting practices produce a lot of garbage in the form of animal bones. Most spectacularly, we know that Neanderthals occasionally hunted mammoth, and they hunted mammoth with stone-tipped spears. And these were not thrown spears, these were thrusting spears. And you might ask, how in the world were they doing that? You'll see in the book a discussion of a site on the Isle of Jersey called La Cata San Berlade. And in the book, we talk about it the way it was talked about 15 years ago was that it was a kind of cliff and the elephants had been driven over the cliff and the Neanderthals had butchered them at the bottom of the cliff. Archaeologists at the British Museum, um, Becky Smith, I think is, is what her name is, uh, went back about 10 years ago and analyzed the faunal material and went back to the site. And she's convinced that there was not, it wasn't a jump site. That is, they were not driving elephants over the cliff, that they're actually hunting them out on the plains about where this picture is taken from, which is now covered with water, but at the time was on, was dry land, and that they had some kind of perhaps trap out there, and that they, they killed the animals, then carried these heavy body parts up to underneath the cliff to process them even further. 
I don't know. It's a, she makes a provocative argument. But the important thing here for us is that Neanderthals butchered several large elephants. It wasn't just one. There were several very, very large animals, and they were killed about the same time. And that suggests that they must have been drawing larger groups of people together, at least temporarily, in order to do that kind of hunt. Also, it requires both a considerable amount of chutzpah and a considerable amount of cooperation to do. And what we know from other Neanderthal sites is that Neanderthals practice cooperative hunting. There's some sites in Germany and some sites in, now in um, Czechoslovakia where uh, it's, it's pretty clear that Neanderthals maneuvered herds of animals to particular points on the landscape where they were then killed in large numbers. And in order to do that, you really do have to have some system of cooperation in place. So cooperatively hunting large animals is what Neanderthals are best known for. But they also ate a number of other things. They were not just hunters. We now have a lot more evidence for Neanderthal fishing. They gathered shellfish. They did some freshwater fishing. They even got some fish from, from the Mediterranean. Uh, we also have evidence for a lot of plant consumption for Neanderthals now. They didn't just eat animals. Um, they ate local plants, local nuts. Um, but based on the chemical analysis of Neanderthal bones and the chemical analysis of dental calculus, most Neanderthals had a very high percentage of meat consumption in their diets. Social cognition is something that Fred and I talk a lot about in the book. And the archaeological evidence and the genetic evidence tell the same story, which is Neanderthals lived in relatively small groups. Most Neanderthal sites are about the size of this one at Lazare Cave uh, in southern France. The living area is about 35 square meters, estimate, you know, five, maybe seven people living in a very small group, probably a nuclear family group, were living at this site. And most Neanderthal sites are like that. There are a few bigger ones like Moldova here, but even the individual structures at Moldova, it's a little hard to see them. It's a much bigger site. You can see the concentrations. There seem to have been the remains of three huts here. What we don't know is whether those three structures were occupied at the same site or at the same time, or whether there was one group that came back over three years and just built the hut in a slightly different place. Can't really tell. And this is a, a site in Spain, the Abric Romani, um, which is, I think, really a, a very interesting site. It's a large rock shelter site. And you can see the remains of fireplaces, these little dark colored ash spots are individual fireplaces. And you can see from the scale here that they're relatively small. Oops, I took a picture out. And they're up against the wall at the back of the shelter, most of them. And what it looks at like is if individual Neanderthals built small fires to lie next to for warmth. There are not big communal fires. There are just lots of little small fires. And that seems to be fairly typical for Neanderthals. What we don't see are big fires with lots of people sitting around big fires. That's not how Neanderthals used fire. They made very small fires, used them to cook a little bit, used to keep themselves warm. Doesn't look as if they were talking into the night. We know a lot about Neanderthals and raw material, where they found the raw material for tools. And it all tells the same story, that Neanderthal groups lived in individual river valleys and didn't move much beyond those river valleys. So that's what the genetic evidence says. That's what the archaeology, archaeology tells us, that there were probably several small family groups living in a river valley. They moved back and forth, occasionally hunted together, occasionally hunted apart. But there weren't very many of them on the landscape. Uh, and socially, this is a very different situation than we see with modern humans. Modern humans have a number of what we call evolved adaptations for social cognition in larger groups. We talk a lot about this in the book. One of these is called cheater detection. We're very good at detecting cheaters. 
Um, this is not anything you need if you're a Neanderthal because you know everybody. You've known them your whole life. You know who the losers are. Um, you don't have to figure it out quickly. You already know. And there's some other social cognitive abilities that we have, especially in terms of exchanging one kind of commodity for another kind of commodity. If you think about it, that's kind of an odd thing to do. We're quite good at making those judgments. It's unlikely that Neanderthals ever had to make those judgments because they never exchanged commodities with other people. A lot of been written on Neanderthal ritual and Neanderthal symbolism, most of which I have to admit is not very good. Um, we do know that Neanderthals did bury the dead occasionally. More commonly, what we find are scattered Neanderthal bones in a site. Krapina is a great example. There are scores of individual Neanderthals, but the bones are all scattered throughout the site. There are no burials. And that's a common pattern as well. But we do have some burials. The Ulmat La Chapelle is a famous one. Uh, one at Kabara Cave in Israel uh, is, has been well excavated. The Kabara site um, is in a very shallow pit. If you look at the profile down at the bottom, um, it's only about 13 inches deep, but the body was laid in the shallow pit and then covered over. Interestingly, the head didn't end up in the pit uh, and the head is, is not there. Um, so the graves are not very deep. They don't have any grave goods, but it does look as if Neanderthals were taking care of the dead. What about symbolism? There's probably been more really sort of mediocre archaeology about symbolism than any other aspect of Neanderthal behavior. We do have some provocative artifacts. The artifact on the right is a long bone with holes punched in it from Krapina. And there are some archaeologists who claim this is a flute. But it can also be, it turns out, be produced by the canines of a cave bear chewing on a long bone. And if you just look at the layout, it doesn't look like a very successful flute. Yet, some people still argue that it's a flute. On the left is the an engraved pebble from a site called Tata. There have been some more developments in Neanderthal art. On the left is a site of Gorham Cave in Gibraltar. And down on the floor of the cave, after they excavated it, what they found were these deep scored marks made by a stone tool in the floor of the cave. Uh, that's the one on the left. Then there's a site in Spain, La Pasiega, which is pushing 60,000 years old. Uh, and there are cave paintings. Um, these are, appear, though the old ones are sort of covered with a calcite layer that's been dated to, again, 50 to 60,000 years. That being the case, it must have been Neanderthals given the location. That's it for Neanderthal cave part. We have more Neanderthal ornaments. Um, again, from Spain, uh, Cueva de los um, On the left, these are shell pendants. They're shell pendants from Cueva Anton. From Krapina in Croatia, there's evidence for eagle claw pendants. Um, some of you may have heard evidence for eagle feathers, also from Krapina. This, but this is the most interesting one. This is a site of Brunekel Cave, um, which was actually, this cave wasn't accessed until about 15 years ago. And this is a large circular arrangement of stalagmites um, that was put together about 170,000 years ago, deep inside this cave. The only folks on the landscape at that point were Neanderthals. We have no idea what's going on here. All we know is that Neanderthals crawled down into this cave and arranged this large circular feature of stone. You can probably come up with as good a guess as I can on this one. Does it mean they had elaborate symbolic behavior? I don't know, maybe. Now, there's also been an argument made about abstraction and abstract abilities from the Gorham Cave you just saw. And I have to really challenge this. Um, I know why they're saying it, because when you see this kind of art in museums in Europe or the United States, it's called abstract expressionism. So therefore, Neanderthals had abstraction. 
The answer is no. Um, that's not what abstraction means. Um, if it is a form of writing, sure, but there's no reason it had to be a form of writing. Artifact on the right uh, is the famous Hollenstein Stadel figurine from Germany. It's Ignatian, it's modern human, it dates to 40,000 years ago. That's an abstract figurine. It's a human body with a lion's head. That's what you need for evidence for abstraction. Scratches in the cave floor, I'm sorry, just don't do it. I'm not gonna say much about language, except to point to a book. A book that came out last year by Rudy Bota, who's a linguist. Entire book dedicated to arguments about Neanderthal language. He goes through all of them. And his conclusion at the end, and he makes a very good job of it, is that none of the arguments for Neanderthal language or speech are convincing, one way or the other. That is, we just don't know about Neanderthal language, and we probably never will. But the only positive thing I can say about that is what Bota found is that the most, per most persuasive argument was tied to Neanderthal hunting. And this is the argument that Fred and I have in our book, that in order to coordinate the hunts, Neanderthals needed an effective, an effective form of communication. And he thought the most likely is a form of, of language. Um, now, maybe, maybe not. Um, he, he didn't find it to be convincing. He just found of all the arguments, the hunting argument was the most persuasive. Okay, I'll run through this pretty quickly. Uh, Cro-Magnons, who are modern humans, arrived in Europe about 45,000 years ago, and they did things a bit differently. First of all, they had a very different approach to hunting. They used what we call managed foraging techniques in which they hunted many different kinds of animals, scheduled the hunting over the course of the year, changed what they were hunting. It's a much different approach to hunting than we saw with Neanderthals. Um, they also used what we call reliable weapons as opposed to maintainable weapons. Uh, these are weapons that take a long time to produce ahead of time. There's a lot of upfront labor, but they're more effective and more reliable. Neanderthals used tools they could fix on the spot. Neanderthal burials, quite different from modern human burials. The modern human burials like Sungir in Russia, 5,000 ivory beads with this burial. The amount of attention paid to corpses was much higher for modern humans. And modern human evidence for art, decorative items, cave painting, these plaques that are ways of keeping track of things, these calculating devices, very different from what modern, what Neanderthals were doing. So to finish up, what are the reasons for thinking Neanderthal cognition was a bit different? This is the argument Fred Coolidge and I have been making. Um, a lot of people really get annoyed with us by this because Neanderthals are supposed to be just like us. First, their brains were different. Second, the genes for brain development were different. Third, their population structure was different. They didn't live in large social groups. They didn't need the kinds of social cognitive abilities we have. The archeological remains were quite different. We have no evidence for reliable technologies, no evidence for things like remotely operated traps, which we have for modern humans, no evidence for long distance trade, no abstract representations, no elaborate grave goods. And of course, Neanderthals are no longer with us. These are reasons for thinking Neanderthal cognition might've been a little different, but there are reasons for thinking there were no differences. Remember, the DNA is 99.7% the same. Their brains were as large as ours. They were interfertile with us. They made ornaments. They made glue. They used cooperative hunting. They cared for the injured. I didn't have time to talk about that one. They cared for corpses. So in many respects, they were very, very much like us. And what about the Neanderthal demise? They vanished as a distinct population soon after 40,000 years ago. Were they victims of genocide? Doesn't appear so. We don't have really much evidence for modern humans killing off Neanderthals. There's only one really good example, 
And that's not a great example. It's only just a good example of a Neanderthal who might have been killed by a modern human. Some have speculated modern humans brought disease with them. That's possible. Um, most people who think Neanderthals went extinct because of modern humans think that modern humans simply outcompeted them, um, that we were just better at succeeding in large scale hunting. Um, we just were better at changing to changes, at adapting to changes in the climate. Today, the most popular explanation is that the Neanderthal population was just too small. That is, there were so few individuals that it eventually reached the point that it couldn't recover and Neanderthals disappeared because of that. The genetic argument is pretty strong for that. And of course, there may be combinations of all of the above. But it is important to know that they did contribute some genes to modern populations. So anyway, I'm sorry, that took a little longer than I thought, but um, I think that will do it. And stop sharing and see if I can answer some questions. So I don't see any questions on the list here. I'll join you, Dr. Wynn. If we don't have any questions, if anybody wants to type their question really quick, um, we still have a little bit of time for questions, and this is a great opportunity to ask. Um, so I think you've got you've got a couple in there. So I'll I'll turn it back over to you. Okay, I actually don't see any questions. Let me see. Oh, I'll switch it over here. Got it. Okay. Um, okay. From from Jerry Rhodes, it says. You showed a fossil gap in Eastern Europe and Western Asia. Is that because we haven't found any fossils there or is it because we haven't looked? Both. Um, people are actually looking, but what, you, what part of the map represented is serendipity. It's where we people have looked and as a consequence have found them. If you saw there are a lot of Neanderthals in the Near East, Part of that is because we've been looking for them in the Near East. And there are areas of Central Asia um, that people have not been looking very hard. So I think that's, that's the major issue. Um, Carla Hendrickson, I recently listened to a talk about insect consumption. Is there evidence to suggest Neanderthals died included insects? I would say almost certainly. That we don't have a lot of evidence for that, but as far as we can tell, Neanderthals ate anything that they could. They were really, they were focused on large animals, but if there were other things available, they ate them. And I would guess they probably ate insects, but that's because a lot of people eat insects. So it's, we might think it's a little weird, but it's fairly common. Um, and uh, let's see, who, from uh, Melanie, uh, can you talk about the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at UCCS? Yes, I can. Um, we do have a website. You can access the website from UCCS. And we offer online courses. They're entirely online. And we, we offer them both for credit and for non-credit. So the non-credit versions are less expensive than the credit versions. We offer courses in Introduction to Cognitive Evolution, Neanderthal Cognition, Paleoneurology, um, Evolution of Ritual and Religion, I'm trying to remember them off the top of the head. Um, we don't offer every course every semester. We usually offer two or three courses a semester. Uh, Emiliana Brunner from University of Burgos teaches our paleoneurology course, and we're thinking of offering it again in the fall. Um, that's a very good course. It's also probably the toughest course that we give. Um, and so probably the best thing to do is access our website or, or email me. Um, I'd be happy to. Uh, exchange email with, with you about the about the center, but we turns out we thought we'd get a lot of students taking it. Probably half the people who take our courses are just interested in the material. Um, from uh, Christina Taylor, um, can skeletons of Neanderthals be found in museums in northern Spain? 
I'm pretty sure if you went to Burgos, you would find um, material from the site at Atapuerca and some of the other sites that are nearby. I can't personally say, because I haven't been in, Japan, in a Spanish museum, so I can't tell you which ones. I'm sure in Madrid you can. Um, there's material from Atapuerca in, in Madrid, I know that. Uh, so, um, but other, but for example, um, Barcelona or uh, the Basque Country, I don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? That looks to do it. Um, whoops. See if I can find, see if I can get to some more. Okay, I think that covers the questions. So thank you very much.